Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we're gonna we're here with Re Rebecca, and she's gonna be uh, giving her presentation she did at Roots Tech with Stefan Harms earlier. So, and she's the creator of Leaving a Legacy book. Uh, you may have heard of that uh, on how she creates books using Family Tree Maker and Family Book Creator and Word. So, uh, why don't you take it away, Rebecca? All right, let me just share my screen here. Here we are. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming by. This won't be too long of a presentation. Uh, as John mentioned, this is the presentation I was offering at Roots Tech this year. Family Tree Maker actually invited me to be a part of their booth. So here's where we were uh, spending long but exciting days at Roots Tech. And it really was amazing if you ever have a chance to go. This is just one of the pictures I took over on the right of the amazing booths that some of these companies came up with. That's Ancestry right there. You can even see they had a gas fireplace at their booth. So very fancy, very fun. And this is just a presentation that's an overview of how I create books and how I think Family Tree Maker and Family Book Creator make things so much easier and faster. If you do have questions, as John said, you can put them in the chat or just unmute. There's not too many of us here today. So once again, my name is Rebecca. I've been working on my family tree for over 20 years. I am 75% Luxembourgish. Uh, I actually used my genealogy research to get my dual citizenship a couple years ago. So now I'm officially a Luxembourgian citizen. If you're not sure which one it is, it's that tiny little country here stuck between Belgium and France and Germany. So why should you care what I have to say? I love creating family history books. It is my very favorite hobby and I just find it thrilling and productive and amazing and I am so grateful to have found this community. This family uh, family book creator users group is where I shared my first book a few years ago and people were so excited and supportive and they kept asking how'd you do that how'd you do that and I wrote a blog post and John invited me to do a few zooms and eventually I wrote a book about how I did that. So this is the book leaving a legacy turn your family tree into a family book and as a step-by-step -step guide to actually doing something with all those years of research that you've been working so hard on. As you'll see in the book, you can use any software you'd like to do it, but I do think that Family Book Creator is the best way to go about things. It's an amazing combination of automation and creativity. So today, oh, let me move my face out of your way. We're gonna do a, we did a quick introduction. We'll talk about planning your book, writing your book, getting it printed, and then finally sharing it with the world. So planning your book, the first thing I usually recommend people do is be honest with themselves. And if you've seen my presentations before, you've probably seen these, but uh, what is getting in your way? If you've thought about creating a family history book before, why haven't you done it yet? If you're anything like me, you need to stop doing these three things. And the first one is researching. Um, it is very easy to tell ourselves, I'm not ready for a book yet. I have to finish my research first. Well, that's kind of absurd. We all know you're never done with your research, right? That's the fun thing about genealogy is that we never feel done. There's always something more to find. And so if you want to get a book done, you're going to have to just set a limit with yourself and say, that's enough for now. If I find more later, it can be a second edition. The next thing is procrastinating. It's very easy to say, oh, well, you know, it's nice weather right now. As soon as my gardening is done, then I'm going to buckle down and really get that book done. But there is always a reason to wait and time is precious. We know that better than anyone. And so you really just need to give yourself a deadline and say, this is happening. The last one is my greatest sin, and that is overthinking. When I was first trying to get started with this project, I kept thinking, oh, this has to be perfect. It has to be a magnum opus. It has to be the best, most complete family history of my entire family there's ever been. None of those things are true. It doesn't have to be any of those things. It just has to be done. So as you're getting started with making a book, I usually recommend you make some decisions early on. And one of them is how you're going to get this book printed. Now, that might feel like something you think about at the end of this project, but I encourage you to think about it now because it can determine what size your book can be. So if you go through this entire process and create a beautiful eight and a half by 11 book and then try to print it at, say, blurb.com, you're going to be real sad because they only print up to eight by 10. <laughs> So if you fall in love with a certain printing solution, you're going to want to know now rather than later. We'll talk about some printing solutions in a bit as well. You're going to want to pick a desktop editor. 
And that's just fancy talk for a computer program that you can type in. I really love using Microsoft Word. It has all the features I want and it works really well with Family Book Creator. You'll wanna think about your book structure and what you want to be in there, how you wanna lay out your generations, what should be in each chapter. And we're gonna talk about this as well. And then really you need to think about your root person and how many generations you wanna work with. So the easy immediate answer might be me, I'm the root person, I'm writing this book, I should be at the base of my ancestor tree. But I really encourage you to think about that because that is a very big project. And when I was trying to get started, that's one of the things that was holding me back because I felt like it had to be about everybody. But if you think about it, if you're doing an ancestor book, every time you go back or up one more generation, you are cutting your workload in half. So trying to write a book about all of my dad's ancestors and all of my mother's ancestors is going to be twice as much work as just doing my dad's. If I go back another generation and do just my grandmother, that's going to be one quarter of the work that it would have been for me to do everybody. And this is a, a very good way to help keep your project manageable, just doing bite off a little chunk at a time. I went even further, I got one more generation back and I chose my great grandparents as base people for my books. Uh, that helped me limit things even more. And for me, that was the right decision uh, in terms of the kind of stories that I wanted to tell. And there's not a right answer at all. It's just something to think about and to, to think about the scope of work and how much you want to take on right now. Uh, so my plan, I've done two books so far. I'm working on number three. My lofty goal is eight. We'll see how it goes. I did get a little sidetracked by this whole leaving a legacy project, but um, think carefully about who your root people should be and how many generations you want to tackle in this book. You can always do another. So chapter structure, these are some things I think should be in a family history book. For each chapter, I like to start off with a smaller family chart. So that's gonna be my main couple, their parents and grandparents and their children. And this is at the beginning of each chapter and this helps give my reader a grounding in where we are in that larger family tree. Because I have a pretty big family tree and by the time my reader gets to chapter seven, they might be a little confused about where we are in that tree. So these smaller charts help give that signpost about where we are. Then I want to have all my data in there. So that's at least birth and marriage and death data. But if you have more, that's always more interesting. If you know occupations and cause of death and things like that, this is where we want to put that information. And Family Tree Maker and Family Book Creator will take care of these first two for you automatically. That work is done. It's amazing with just a few clicks. I personally like to add these third and fourth things as well, but they are optional. And so if you want to make your book with just those first two, Fantastic, I will cheer you on, but let's talk about the other options in case you're interested. So I like to handwrite biographies for each of the couples in my primary and my first three generations. And by handwrite, of course, I mean type on my computer. Uh, why do I do that? Uh, mostly it gives me so much more freedom in writing their story and how, how I go from thing to thing, and specifically how I place photos. So if you notice in this example picture here, I have a picture of, so my ancestor was a toll gate operator, and this is a photo from the historical society, and it's right along next to this explanation of how toll gates worked back then. That's the kind of thing I wanted to do with my book because I felt like I wanted a discussion of the 1900 census to be next to a picture of the 1900 census and things like that. That was originally what sent me down this path. I also like this as an opportunity to add more context to my story. So when I first saw in the census that my ancestor was a toll gate operator, I just put that in, occupation, toll gate operator. But I realized I didn't really have a good sense of what that involved. And so when I started researching and learning all about plank roads, which are roads they tried to make out of wood, terrible idea, <laughs> don't do that. Uh, but they did it and they tried, they gave it a good try. And that was fascinating to me. And I knew that my other family members uh, reading this book wouldn't have any sense of that either. So I took the opportunity to research that and include a discussion of that in my book. And this sort of free narrative allowed me the space to do that. And they can be applicable to other things. You know, Why did people come over from Luxembourg at this time? How did the civil war affect this entire town? So things like this, which are broader in scope and hard to attach to like one fact for one person are really easy to put in a narrative like this. And finally, it helps my readers to interpret the data. So, you know, as researchers, uh, we're pretty used to looking at census records, right? We know how to pull things out of there. But my grandmother, who was the target audience for my book, she doesn't know She's never seen a census in her life. And so it's kind of on me to pull out those facts and make them into a story for her and help bring it to life. 
So definitely think about who your target audience is for your book, because that will determine how you write and how you put things together. All that said, obviously, as much as I love writing these narratives, they're a big time commitment. They are by far the majority of time that I spend on my books. And not everybody has that time or wants to put their time into that. And that's okay. If you just want to do the automatic stuff from Family Book Creator, that's so cool. And it's it's something, whatever book is right for you, that's the one I want you to write. So I don't want anyone to feel like you have to go this far. I'm pretty extra in general. <laughs> kind of the same thing with images. Um, they are often, I find, the, the reader's favorite part of the book. Uh, as soon as I hand my book to someone, they're immediately flipping the pages to try to find the most interesting pictures in there. And they really help bring things to life. So we are used to thinking of these of, of these people as real people or researchers. But um, for my grandmother, just seeing a name on a page doesn't mean a lot to her. And if I'm able to add some photos to it, that helps her re realize and really feel on a gut level, hey, this was a real person who really lived. Um, and that that's a, that's a big part of pictures for me. And it doesn't have to be just pictures of people. So I have a lot of document scans in my books. So I'll use church records, draft cards, um, birth certificates, anything like that I can find, I will include in my books to help provide that context and to give a, a break for the reader's eyes on a page. Uh, but as well, I, I of course still use pictures of people, but also of houses and of things. And I get a lot of people who say, I don't have any family photos, you know, so I just can't have any in my book. And that's not true. You have so many opportunities to have images in your book, even if you don't have any family photos at all. So here are some of those opportunities, uh, places to find images. Uh, my favorite one is to find old paintings or postcards of the city in question, or especially the church. Uh, so you can see an example of that on the right. This was a, a couple who lived long before cameras, but I still wanted some beautiful pictures in their chapter, and I found this painting of their town. Similarly, you can find pictures of old-fashioned items. So I might have a picture of a cool little apple peeler that my great-grandmother used or an old farm implement that my great-great-grandfather had, or maybe ethnic clothing. What did a young Luxembourgish man wear in 1880? What was classic uh, example of that? Or if I can't find a photo of the house, I'll look for photos of other houses in that same town. It's not an ancestral home or an ancestral shirt, but it does help tell that story and help bring these people to life for my readers. I love to find paintings. So first I find the name of the ship that my ancestor immigrated on, and then I look for paintings of that ship in particular, or photographs if you're really lucky. Um, I, it's a great ad. When I find them, I, I use a whole page of my book to include it in there because it's really so impactful to imagine your ancestor sitting, um, standing on the bow of that ship and the enormity of the decision they had made and the consequences of that decision. I just, it's delicious. Uh, coat of arms is another one if you're sort of scraping the barrel for things to put in there. Sometimes you have one for your family, but often there's one for the state or even the city. I like to find maps of the country itself that were made back then, not just now. So uh, I do a lot of work in Western Europe and there's something called the Ferraris map. I want to say it was the 1770s. Um, it was originally a military application. They ordered it so they knew where to drag their cannons around. But in the process, they accidentally made this beautiful, accurate time capsule of the entire continent, uh, that half the continent. And I love to find uh, close-ups and zoom in on the cities of my, of my ancestors and include those pictures in my book as well. Uh, military uniforms, you can usually find descriptions or especially paintings of them if, you're, if your ancestor served in the military. And then, of course, there's gravestones, findagrave.com, billion graves, or if you can swing it, a trip to the graveyard yourself so you can take your own pictures um, can really help round out a chapter for a couple. Oh, somebody, Susan is asking, how do you insert a narrative into Family Book Creator? I haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, I can definitely talk a bit about that. Uh, remind me of that at the end if I don't come back to it. So handling image, basically you have these four options. And um, the simplest one is always gonna be just don't include them. If the thought of going through all those shoe boxes of photos makes your shoulders come up around your ears and makes you procrastinate and put this project off, that's fine, don't do it, no pictures, great. You're gonna have a text only book and it's gonna be amazing because you did it and it's done and you should feel free to do that. Or you might say, okay, I'll have a few pictures but only wedding portraits or only formal family portraits or any other rule that you can think of that helps set these guidelines for your project so it doesn't get out of control and it doesn't feel overwhelming for you. 
I'd say the most popular one is probably that third one, which is letting Family Book Creator handle all the pictures. So Family Book Creator is going to reach in the Family Tree Maker, find all the pictures attached to the relevant people, and organize them for you on uh, photo album pages at the end of each chapter, even including captions and descriptions. And it's really quite amazing. Um, you should take advantage of it if that feels reachable for you. And finally, of course, the last option, the lots of work option, that's the one I do, and that is sprinkling pictures in among my narrative text. So here's some examples of what that looks like. So I like to have text next to photos. This is, by the way, why I use a landscape, a horizontal page and not a vertical, because I really like the, pic the look of text flowing next to pictures. Again, this is something that's fun for me. I like graphic design. It's satisfying. It's enjoyable. That's why I do it. So you have to decide if it feels enjoyable for you. In conclusion, uh, images are really amazing. They're so fun. But if they stop you from completing this project, they're not worth it. Keep moving. Don't let a sorry, don't let a speed bump become a roadblock in your project. So let's talk about actually writing your book using Family Book Creator. So Family Book Creator is a plugin for Family Tree Maker, and that means it's separate software, but it adds new features and capabilities. And basically, you're going to keep your data in Family Tree Maker, that's where it lives. Family Book Creator is gonna reach in and turn it into a book for you automatically. What are some of the things Family Book Creator does? It makes those family charts I talked about at the beginning of each chapter. It takes all of your bullet points of data, that birth, marriage, death thing stuff, and turns it into a sentence for you. So so-and-so was born on this date in this area and his parents were these people. And it just makes it much more enjoyable for a human to read instead of that list of data. It handles all of your citations for you. It can do endnotes, footnotes, bibliography, all of that. It will create a table of contents for you automatically, which is pretty cool. I love the indexes. This is one of my favorite features. It will create an index at the end of your book with every person mentioned, except in your if you do handwrite narratives, that's not included. But every person mentioned, sorted by surname, same with the places. So you can see how many of your family lived in Boston, and it's super helpful. It includes color coding. So if you use color coding in Family Tree Maker, a family book creator understands that and includes it as well. So in this example, you can see a couple of red dots next to the names under um, Allendorf and Ab Althauser and my book. It has privacy protection. If you have some people you don't want to be included, no problem. And of course, it handles photos and narratives, as we already talked about. So this is an example of a table of contents from Family Book Creator. And one thing I just really appreciated when I was first trying to get started and I was kind of spinning my wheels trying to figure out how this book was going to look, I loved that Family Book Creator did this for me and said, okay, first generation, second generation, third generation, laid it all out like this. And I said, great, I'll do that. Again, there's no right answer, but it's really helpful to have a structure to work with. So honestly, it takes four clicks to get started. After four clicks, you can have your first draft of a Family Book Creator book and then you can start playing with it if you want. So uh, literally all you have to do is one, choose the kind of book type that you wanna do, an ancestor or descendant book. You need to choose the person who's gonna be a root person as we talked about. Choose the number of generations you wanna work with. I always recommend just starting with one while you're getting your feet under you and sort of figuring out how the software works. And then create document. And with these four clicks using only default settings, not touching anything else in the software, I have a book that looks like this. So I've got that beautiful chart over on the left with all my pictures from Family Tree Maker organized for me. And now I have my data. So here's Charles and his data has been turned into sentences at the top. And here you've got a table of data as well because the census facts, um, because they have that really long description field, they default to a list format like this for me. It goes right into his wife. And then after that, there's more pages you can't see with their children. All of this is automatic. And even if you wanna make changes later, it's so much easier to edit something that's already there for you than to try to create it from scratch. And if you like this layout, if you look at this draft and think, great, perfect, done, great, perfect, done, uh, send it off to a printer and your work is done. Uh, if you'd like to make some tweaks, if you like a little more control over things like me, you can easily make those changes. So here, as I, I've circled in red, those are the census facts. Um, maybe I look at this and think, oh, those are kind of cluttering up my page. My book is too long. I, they're kind of repetitive. I don't want these in here. No problem. I'm going to go back to Family Book Creator, and I'm going to look for the residence fact type, and I'm going to uncheck the box next to that, and I'll rerun it. And as you can see, now it's jumping directly from Charles to his wife, Clara, and all those residence facts are gone. 
just that easy. Uh, you can also add things in. So right now I've got information about their children, their, their daughter up here, Anne Marie Schmidt has her birth and her death information. That's great. Maybe I want to go a little further. Maybe I want to dig and have some more information about who she married in my book. No problem. Back to Family Book Creator. I'm going to find the box that says include spouse or partner details, and I'm going to check it. Rerun Family Book Creator. And now on the right, you can see I have information on her husband, um, helpfully included. And that's happening for every person in the book. It's just that easy to add and subtract things. Uh, this is also how we can add photos. Does someone have a question? Okay. Uh, so here, if we go back to Family Book Creator, we want to add a photo album. That's pretty easy. I'm going to check the box next to include photo album, run it again. And now here's an example page with a photo album. These are taken directly from Family Tree Maker and those uh, captions are all included for me. And yes, I get this question a lot. You can delete photos if you'd like, or you can filter them out in the first place. So it's very easy to adjust this if I don't want funeral cards included, for example. And Family Book Creator also does other stuff. So it's, it kind of does all the things that makes a book a book. It adds a title page for you. It does the colophon, the dedication, forward, table of contents. All of these things are done for you. Even this introduction on the right bottom corner, that's all automatically created by Family Book Creator. It even includes the names of my ancestors in there. It has a legend for interpreting what the different color dots mean. All of that is done for me. I can edit it later, but I love having this done. So <clears throat> embedding narratives, uh, this is where I'm writing a separate biography for each couple in my tree. I have a different Word document for each of them. So this is one example here. This is Nick Creer and Anna Yaley. And it's hard to see from here, but this is page one. This is it, figure one. This is citation one. This is a specific Word document just for this couple. But when I run Family Book Creator, it knows to grab this document and stick it in the middle of my book exactly where it belongs right after this chart for Nick and Anna and right before their summarized data. Uh, everything is blended. The citations have all been renumbered. The figures have all been renumbered. It's like it's always lived there its whole life. It's just so helpful. If you wanna be extra, you can even add code here to include your biographies in those indexes if you want. And Susan, the short answer here is that I attach the document to the person in Family Tree Maker the same way that I would do that with any other picture. It's just media. And then I add special media categories to it that Family Book Creator uses to know what to do with them. So there's a list of those Family Book Creator media categories in the user guide. I, I think John can mention specifically where they are in the Family Book Creator user group, but they are available. And once you add them to those documents, when Family Book Creator runs, it knows to put those um, in the book. One thing that I see sometimes people don't realize, you do have to say include photo album to make them appear. Even though they're not photos, really it should be called a media album because that's what they are. So make sure you have added those media categories and you have enabled the photo album and attached these documents to the people. So those are the three things you kind of have to make sure you do to make sure they appear in your book. So uh, Family Book Creator really makes your book so repeatable. It's so helpful. So let's say you go through this whole process, you make a book, you hand it proudly to your family and your cousin Sally is like, oh, I don't really care about that half of the family. Can't it be just us half? No problem, cousin Sally. Back to Family Book Creator, change that root person like we talked about, hit create document and now Sally has her own version of the book. Or let's say you've been working on it and it's getting really long and you change your mind about photos and you say, nah, I don't want them anymore. Uncheck that box, redo it. Fine, no pictures. Or maybe you want to have different versions of the book. So the version for me, I wanted to have all the citations, but my grandmother is never going to look up any of this. And maybe I don't want citations taking up room in my book. No problem. I uncheck the box for her. She's got her version. I've got my version. It's just so easy to customize. And then this is really helpful when it comes to that first problem we talked about, about feeling like you have to finish your research before you can write a book. Uh, you can go through this whole process and finish your book and publish it. Keep researching. Maybe two years down the line, you think, oh, I've got so much great new stuff. Great. Back to Family Book Creator. Hit Create Document again. And now all of your new research is incorporated into this new version of the book. It's just that easy. And it really helps free your brain to feel like this is something you can get started on now because you can always update it again later. 
<laughs> if you are going to give Family Book Creator a try, I have these recommendations. And the first one is to start by cleaning your tree as much as you can. So that means things like resolving place names, choosing preferred facts, adding citations, um, everything you can do. A clean tree creates a clean book, right? So the more you can do to, to streamline things, the better. So this is a really important step. However, it is also a step where I see a lot of people get stuck because you end up in that you know, going down that spiral of everything has to be perfect or I'm not quite done cleaning the tree yet and you never get started on your book. If you feel yourself starting to spin your wheels like that, you need to just cut it off. The cleaning phase is over for you. It's as clean as it's going to be. That's fine. Move along, make your book. As you're making your book, you're going to want to do a lot of test runs. So I like to test with just one generation over and over again until I have finalized the settings and that just saves me time versus having to create the whole book every time. Uh, this third one here is uh, something you already know about, which is joining the Family Book Creator Users Group on Facebook. Uh, this is something I wanted everyone at Roots Tech to know that they should go do because this group is so amazing and so helpful and so supportive. And then finally, if you're finding mistakes or things you want to change after you run Family Book Creator, you could fix it in that Word document afterwards, but I really encourage you to take a minute and go back to Family Tree Maker. Fix it there. For one thing, then your tree will be more accurate. For another, then if you have to rerun Family Book Creator down the line again, either for Cousin Sally or because you've been researching for another few years, you don't want to have to make that change every time in the Word document. So take the time, put the time in now to fix it where it needs to be fixed, and then all of your future books are going to be correct. Printing your book. So you go through this entire project and the beautiful manuscript. We do not want it to live and die on your computer. We want to get it out into the world, into your hands. So one option for printing is to do it at home. It's easy. It's familiar. You know how to use your desktop printer. You can do it as you go. You don't have to have an entire book done before you start printing. That's pretty helpful. And it's really easy to make changes later. If you just want to pull a single page out of your binder, you can do that and replace it. So those are there's some reasons to consider this method. Uh, it's not my favorite. I think it's very time consuming. If you have any pictures in your book, it's very ink consuming. Um, I don't know about you, but my printer never works the first time I ask it to do anything. It's just frustrating for me. I think it's not as polished of a look and it's just more difficult to make copies to share. It's a very physical process for you to sit there and, and copy each page. So I instead prefer to use something called print on demand. Now, this is a relatively new technology. It didn't exist a few years ago. If you wanted your book printed on a real printing press years ago, you had to order 500 or 1,000 copies or more in order to do that. These days, you can get a book printed like this for one single copy. It blows my mind, and it feels so official and beautiful. And um, normally, here's where I would pull out my example book, but I, I gave them all to Stefan at Roots Tech, so I'm still waiting for my samples to be replaced. Um, but it's just, I can't tell you the feeling to open a book like this and realize that you made it, you brought this to life, and have it on your coffee table and have other people read it. The other great thing about print on demand is that it is so easy to share copies. So hopefully, you're not the only one who's going to read this book. Hopefully, you have cousins or kids or grandkids who want to read it. And all you do is take the hyperlink and share it with them. And if they want a copy of this book, they can go to this link. They can pay the printer. They can have the printer ship it right to their door. You are not in the middle of any of it. I can't tell you what a great feeling that is not to be the middleman in this process. Um, you don't have to buy 20 books and hope 20 people want them. Everything is done so efficiently printed as it's ordered. Really helpful. It's also not as expensive as you might think. So these numbers, by the way, are from last year. Um, they are from lulu.com, L-U-L-U. -L -U, and this is just my favorite print-on-demand printer. I've tried a couple of them. There's no right answer. There's a lot of great ones. Um, but just to give you an, a, a sense of pricing, uh, if you want a very small book, just 40 pages, even in color, it's going to be four bucks. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. And the things that increase prices are going to be whether you print your pages in black and white or color. That is the biggest jump. Color is going to be a, a a big increase in price, but I really hope that you can swing it because your work deserves to be in color. You've been working so hard on it for so many years. Uh, the thickness of the paper is another factor. So uh, 60 pound paper is going to be thinner than 80 pound. 80 pound has a nice coating on it, but it makes it feel more like a real coffee table book. It's really beautiful. That's what I use for my family books. And then finally, what kind of cover you want to use. There's soft cover and hard cover. There's spiral bound, things like that. That's going to change the price as well. 
but even a 300 page book printed on premium premium printing in black and white with an 80 pound page the nice one with a spiral bound soft cover that's 22 dollars plus even plus taxes and shipping i mean you can't beat that for the quality that you're getting um, the other great thing about print on demand is that you can have multiple versions of your book. So if you go on my website, you're going to see the the really nice full color premium uh, 80 pound hardcover book. That's what I wanted. And that's what I gave my grandmother. But I had a lot of cousins who were vaguely interested, but not ready to pay that kind of money. And so I also have a black and white version with regular printing on a paperback. And that is available for people who would like this information, but maybe aren't ready to to pay for that much and it just it makes it so much except so much more accessible to more people in your family and it literally takes like another I don't know 15 minutes to set it up with your printer and um, it's just it's really worth it and so easy to do. Lulu also has a cover creator so if you're not sure what should go on the outside of your book you can use one of their templates here you just upload a picture choose a color type in what you want for your title and what you want on the back cover it's really simple to do if you want to have a little more creativity and control Lulu also works with canva.com which is a free graphic design website and they have a whole bunch of templates you can play with and here this gives you a little bit more graphic control over what you're doing. Uh, and Lulu will automatically work with Canva to tell it what size to use. Um, but you just you do need to pay attention to that if you start trying to use templates. Oh, by the way, the, the third option would be if you're extra like me is to make your cover in Photoshop or something similar, and then you just upload it as a PDF and then it's used for you. So let's say you've gone through this whole process and you've gotten it printed. We also do not want it to live and die on your bookshelf. We want to get it out there in the world and we want our, our research to outlive us. <clears throat> so you could order just that single copy for you, as I mentioned. I hope you don't. Um, I hope you share it with other members of your family so that they can order copies as well. Another option is actually to put it in the publisher's bookstore. So Lulu itself has a bookstore on their website. If you go there right now, you'll find copies of my books. Uh, I will say that I haven't had one sale there in four years, but it's still exciting to feel like an author who has your book in a bookstore. Another option is to go global and distribute via retailer like Amazon. Um, this, I think, is a better option for if you have ancestors with more universal stories, if you have, you know, a World War II memoir or things like that, that lots of people might want to read. This is an option for you. I will warn you, it is complex, more complex than I thought when I started down that path, and they do take a big cut. So Amazon, for example, takes 40% off the top before you even pay for printing. So it just means you have to have higher prices, and it's something to think about if you're going to go down that path. Oops, I moved my face in front of my buttons. There we go. Uh, if you are going to be doing this, you do not want to wait until the last second, right? Uh, it takes several weeks to get books from a printer. So if you're trying to do this for an event, like a birthday party or a family reunion, you want to leave yourself a lot of time for that book to arrive. If possible, try to leave twice as much time for the book to arrive, because then you can have a, a physical print proof to look over. And I will tell you, there are mistakes you just don't see when they're on a screen. I, you can look at something a hundred times on the screen, and then as soon as you open the book and it's in your lap, it's jumping out at you. It's a typo you missed from the first day. And it's, I don't know why that is. It's just one of those things that's happened with every single book I've ever done. And so give yourself extra time to find those mistakes before you print a whole bunch of anything. Once you have a good copy of it, uh, there are a couple ways you can get out in the world. I always donate copies to my local historic, historical societies, the ones that are relevant for the people in the book. So there's the Luxembourg American Cultural Society. They're my favorite. This is a nice thing to do, of course, but it's not purely altruistic. This is me leaving breadcrumbs for other researchers to find me. So if someone walks into the Luxembourg American Cultural Center and sees a book on the shelf and says, Watchries, I'm a Watchery, and they pull it down to look at it, they might reach out to me. They might have other Watchery photos for me to look at and share or discuss. And um, that's what I'm really hoping will happen. And that's a similar idea to sharing it online. So if you go to, I have all of my information is uh, on a public tree on Ancestry. You're going to find a picture of this book in the entries for the people who are in it. And hopefully those are showing up as photo hints for other people. But if anyone else is studying Charles Peter William Schmidt, I want them to reach out to me. I want to work with them. Um, same for my tree on my heritage. Anywhere I have a public tree, I have links to this book. 
I also do this for cooperative trees. So if you go on Family Search right now, you're gonna and you look for Charles Peter William Schmidt, you're gonna find a link to my book there because hopefully other people who are on his page are other also researching him and they can find me and we can work together. Make sure you have permission whenever you're doing things on a cooperative site like that. And then Facebook groups. So I look for groups that are devoted to the hometowns of my ancestors. So I'll go to the Port Washington, Wisconsin group, say, hey, if anybody here is descended from the Michael Kolbach family in Port Washington, you might be interested in this book. Again, make sure you have permission because this can be seen as self-promotion. So uh, you don't wanna do it in just any group. And then the family book creator group, please come back and share your group, your work with us. We're probably not gonna buy your book, but we're gonna be so excited for you. I will tell you, there is no one like other genealogists to understand all the effort that went into creating this book. So we wanna be excited with you. Please come and share it in the group. So in conclusion, you can do this. Start small, don't try to be perfect, and don't give up. You can't fail if you don't give up. So if you found this presentation helpful or interesting, but you would like more details, more examples, and more screenshots and where to actually click to do these things, please go check out my book, Leaving a Legacy, Turn Your Family Tree into a Family Book. You can find that on RebeccaShamblin.com, as well as through Family Tree Maker, but it will be faster through my website. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. And uh, if you have any questions, please speak up. Yeah, if you have questions, uh, yeah, just be sure to unmute yourself. So, but that was a very good presentation, Rebecca. Thank, Thank you. you. I gave it many, many times over the course of two days. <laughs> uh, this is Susan Quinn. If I could jump in again, I find when I run Family Book Creator, uh, my information in Family Tree Maker must not be terrific, which I'm not surprised at. But I, but I then end up with a book that has sort of truncated sentences it's like they're looking for information and and I've got half a sentence there and then the rest of the sentence and then it just goes on to the next fact so what am I doing wrong in Family Tree Maker I think we'd want to take a look at it because Family Book Creator does let you customize how those sentences are created so it oh. may be that that so for the, the description field, for example, can yeah. be used in a lot of different ways. So in my books, I like to have, you know, for a baptism fact, I put my godparents in there and the priest, but other people put the name of the church. And it kind of depends on who, how you use those fields. Then mm. you might have to make adjustments in Family Book Creator about how that's done. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. And John and Stefan might be more helpful in, for technical things like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, Mickey says, could you review inserting the nar narrative again, please? Sure. Um, I don't know if I have a great slide for that, but let's just go back there. And this is something I definitely go over in my book step by step as well, because this is literally my favorite feature of Family, Tree of Family Book Creator is the ability to do this. This is why I chose Family Book Creator in the first place. Um, so I go into Microsoft Word and I write a biography for one couple. And then I save that on my computer and I attach that in Family Tree Maker to the person. So let me change how I'm sharing my screen and we can just do it together real quick if you want. All right, hopefully you can see Family Tree Maker now. No. So I'm gonna change to a person who actually has one of these. to show you how I did it. All right, so here, let's do Charles here. So Charles Peter William Schmidt is the man I was talking about in my presentation. You can see I have a whole bunch of pictures for him in my media tab along the bottom of this screen. The very last one here is a Word document and it's I, I titled mine all with the word notes so that they're all filed together in the media tab. This, if I double click and open this, this is gonna open in Word and this is my chapter that's just about Charles and his wife, Clara. That's all that's in this chapter. Um, but if I go back to Family Tree Maker and I look at this um, in the media field, so now mm -hmm. I've got this notes selected and I go to the media categories, oops, covered up by the Zoom. You can see I have a whole bunch of categories in here. So I'm gonna hit edit so we can look at them more closely. These are those special categories that the Family Book Creator uses 
And these are what you need to add to your uh, document in order to, to tell Family Book Creator, hey, I want you to do this. The only critical one here is handle story as text. These other ones that I have are more about where I want this document to be included in the book. So I have one here saying, put this after the family chart. And I have one here saying, start it on a new page. So if my chart only takes up half the page, I don't want my story to start underneath that because my layout is all designed to be on a new page. So after I've attached that document in Family Tree Maker and I've added these categories, and I attach it just like I would any other picture, I can drag and drop or I can insert. When I go to run Family Book Creator, so let me just open that. One thing to make sure of as you're writing in Word is to choose the same settings for the page layout that you have in Family Book Creator. So if you're doing a, a horizontal book in your biography and Family Book Creator is making a vertical one, that's not going to go well. <laughs> Okay, so in Family Book Creator, I'm going to look into items to include because I'm trying to tell it what I want in my book. And I'm going to go all the way over to the right to photo album. And right now, because I've been playing with settings and teaching people, I don't have photo album enabled. So if I was to run Family Book Creator right now, my chapter would not show up because it's part of the media and I haven't told Family Book Creator to do that. So I would need to choose include photo album. And then these filters are a little more complex. You shouldn't, if you're trying to print all your pictures and your document, don't worry about the filters. Um, these are just something you do if you wanna be more specific with it. So when I, if I were to hit create document right now, it's gonna, oh, I suppose I can do it right now, but let's not do it for everybody or it will take a very long time. <laughs> This of course is my my great grandparent great grandmother's parents, so it's the longest chapter in my book. They are not all this long, I assure you. It took a long time to get through that. I will also recommend that you write the chapters in order. With my first book, I kind of jumped around and I wrote whatever couple I felt inspired to write about next, but that was difficult in the end because when I mentioned global things like how did the Civil War happen or why were the Luxembourgish immigrants coming over, I was never sure what I had already written in the book. So for my second book, I got more strict with myself and said, you have to write this in order. So I did the hardest chapters first. And it feels hard in the beginning, but it sort of rolls faster and faster the farther you go. So right now it's inserting the content. You can see it was inserting my Word document into the resulting Word document. Should be here in a minute. And OK, so now it's opened up. This is the book that Family Book Creator made for me. I'm going to make it so we can see more pages because we're just looking at an overview. I'm gonna scroll down to the Charles chapter. Okay, so it has created this family tree chart for me here. And then, um, so this is one of the hazards of, of doing the horizontal book when you have Catholic families with lots and lots of kids. Sometimes they don't all fit on one page. So um, in this case, I actually take this, um, this heading and I make it a text box in the middle of my chart for my final books, that's what you'll notice. That's kind of the trick I use to do that. But um, the important thing is you can see it went from the chart and then it has inserted that Word document right here. If I scroll to the end of that chapter that I wrote by hand, now it's getting into this page, which is um, the information that Family Book Creator has done automatically for me. Does that make sense? Oh, and this, by the way, this heading, uh, this is a cheat as well. There is no way to add a heading before the Family Book Creator content. What I do is add that heading to the end of my individual chapter. So I've switched back to the individual Charles and Clara chapter, and I'm going to show you what I did here. I've got this as the very last thing in my chapter. And then when I run Family Book Creator, it looks like it, it's a heading for the other stuff. It's just, it's a way to cheat. Yeah. And Thomas asked, uh, how do you get Family Book Creator to create landscape books? Oh, sure. Uh, we're going to go into preferences. So we were in book items, and we're going to go to preferences. And we're going to look at uh, text and page layout. And in the upper right corner, it says format. And here is where I have said I want. So normally, it would be 11 by 8 and a half. Uh, I have what's 
called bleed here, which is because I like to use um, a backdrop, a colored sort of parchment paper look on every page of my book. And I want it to go all the way to the edges instead of getting cut off. That's why mine is bigger. It's 11.25 by 8.75. But if you just have white pages, you can just do 11 by eight and a half. And this is where that would happen. And here with page margins and things like this, this is also what you want to make sure is the same for Family Book Creator and for your um, biography. If you're writing one in Word, you want to have the same margins. Uh, one thing to, to, oh, one thing to note if we're getting this specific is to turn off the mirror margins for now. So mirror margins are when you're, when you're printing a book and you've got um, the center of the book, the gutter, and you don't want to lose a lot of things in the gutter of the book. So a word can automatically push everything out farther to the outside of the edges of the pages, which is super helpful. And it is something you want to use in the end. But if you're trying to do this um, merge between your handwritten biographies and FBC, don't turn it on until the very end. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to stop sharing so I can check the chat. Okay. And just put in chat or unmute yourself if you have any questions. I know that John has been running some super helpful classes on FBC. I'm also doing a study group through a couple of historical societies, the Kin Seekers and the Pastfinders. And we are doing one Zoom a month for five months and sort of slowly going through the whole process together, doing a little at a time. Um, you can, I think, still join that for a couple more weeks if that's something you want to do. Um, if you want to do that, I'm just going to type my website in here. Um, go on my website and look under speaker, and that's got a link to that um, study group if you want to join that. Becca? Yes. Uh, on oh, your, hi, Bill. The piece that you're uh, creating and uh, putting into your book, do you do that? And then it's... Um, I guess the, where I'm getting confused at is on your rest of your book where you say you're using Family Tree Maker to do the rest of it. So you're basically all your facts that's in Family Tree Maker uh, is going like it was. You're just putting a biography on the two. You're yeah. The two people. Yeah, good question. Um, because of the way I do my biographies, when I, um, let me show it again. When I run Family Book Creator, I tell it not to include other kinds of facts. So right now I'm going into book items and items to include, just to show you with my primary person. I have birth, marriage, and death, but I don't have any of these other fact types selected because I prefer to talk about them manually myself in my biography. So those do not appear in that section that's automatically created because I don't want them to. But if you are not writing a biography, you are going to want to select these things like occupation so that Family Book Creator can include a sentence for that um, in your book. For mine, they are not in there. Okay. Yeah, what I'm trying to, what I'm doing right now is I'm creating the, uh, like my parents, I'll just use them for example. I, I uh, put the uh, information in there in the Family Tree Maker, but I don't have the, in, in the Family Book Creator, I, I disabled all the facts. Okay. Then I write a biography in the personal yep. notes, but I like what you're doing with the, the pictures, and I, so I don't know. I guess I'm getting confused how I can add the pictures without, uh, without having to go to Word and do, do the every single person like. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I understand making myself clear or not, but. So you 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 yeah. would like to have a photo album created by Family Book Creator, like the pictures in no, there? I do. I have the. Photo albums, but I would instead of having them at the end, I'd like to find a way to put them in with the biography. But not all the pictures that I got or the uh, media is related to the biography. I don't sure. Know if that makes sense. I mean, yeah, you you can put the ones that do relate in there, and the other ones not have those in there. So um, if you look at my photo album, I have a filter here that says "Do not print." When I have pictures in my family tree maker attached to somebody that I don't want to appear in the book, I label them as do not print. There's a few that I do want to come out. So when I, I have a fourth generation, um, I don't write biographies for them, but I do want a couple things to show up for them. So that's how I kind of handle that. So you could have a biography and still have some pictures in the family book creator photo album, but not all of them by using filters. 
Does that right, so I can so I can take the pictures that I want in the biography and then the other ones I still want them in the book but mm -hmm. then they'll show up at the end mm -hmm. yeah okay. so in family tree maker using media categories that's how you would tell family book creator which ones to put in there and which ones to skip okay yeah and Lois uh, had asked, could you please review the mirror margins aspect and when, why to turn them back on? Yeah, sorry, that was not very clear because I hadn't actually prepared to talk about it. Um, I'm gonna make sure you can see me. Let me grab a book to show. Okay, so when you have a paperback book like this or a hardcover, you can see in the middle, in the gutter, um, if you if you don't have a large enough margin there, you're going to start losing words, right? You're, it's going to be hard to read on the inside. So generally, when making books, we try to put a larger margin on the inside page than on the outside. We want a lot of space in there so that the gutter doesn't swallow up our data. But because we have left and right pages, that looks different for different um, for, for left and right pages. Let me show you an example of that, too. Okay, I'm going to open up a Word document version of my family history book. And then we can see that because that's when I have mirror margins turned on. And they're called mirror margins because it's a mirror on the left and the right. So let's see a good example of that. Mm. Trying to find one without a, a tab so you can see it clearly. Okay, so let's look at this picture. This these two pages right here. On the left side, we have Charles and Clara. This margin, uh, I don't know how to show it. <laughs> On the left side, this margin is much wider. The space between this word immigrant and the, the end of the page is much bigger than over here. The space between this picture and the right side of the page is less. That's because in my family history book, this is the side of the page that's stuck in the gutter and we wanted to have extra room. But if you look at this page over here, this one is smaller and this one is wider because in that page, that's the side that's in the book. Now, unfortunately, Microsoft Word makes this super confusing because it feels like these should be swapped left and right, right? And that's what they would be. Uh, but Microsoft Word doesn't let you show that this first page should be in the right side of the screen because in a book, page one is on the right. Um, one way to get around this is to look in print preview, but I, I will say, I'm sorry, that part is confusing. It should, it should look different on the screen, but Word is not great about that. So, um, yeah, sorry, I don't have a better example of that. Um, I can do a blog post on that maybe because I think that is confusing for a lot of people, but the mirror image is just a different width of margin on the left and right side of the page to make sure that nothing gets swallowed in the gutter. And it has to be either the left or the right side, depending on what kind of page it is. Oh, that's not a good explanation. Hopefully you can see the example of why these pages are different. And just know that in Family Book Creator, if you're doing this, you should turn that off because it gets confused. And then only turn it on right when you're ready to print your book. And you would do that in Word, not in Family Book Creator. So I'm just gonna show you, it's under layout and margins. It's taking a second, I want to. Okay, so here under, under pages is where I select that near margins. I did not do that until my whole book was ready to go. I just kept everything in the middle in the meantime. Sorry, I can't be more clear about that. And then uh, Richard uh, asked, I've built my tree on Ancestry and then linked to Family Tree Maker to capture the facts. So I'm not as familiar with Family Tree Maker as I should be. Can you re recommend how I can become more familiar with Family Tree Maker? Oh, let's see. So there is a Family Tree Maker users group, just like there's a Family Book Creator users group. I know they have a lot of guides in there that you can do. Um, they have a user guide, just reading the user guide. Uh, it's The online version is free. You don't have to order the book. That can be really helpful. 
Um, I find nothing so helpful as just trying it though, <laughs> trial and error, just getting in there, playing with the data. So Family Book Creator is a great way to find problems in your tree because it brings everything together for you. So the first thing I would do is just run Family Book Creator with one generation and see what's coming out and see if that's what I would expect to happen and then sort of dig if that's not what I expected to happen. Um, yeah, I think those would be my suggestions. <laughs> Yeah, and I did post links to the Family Book Creator, Family Tree Maker Users Group, and there's also okay. a link for if you're a Mac user, you may also want to. There's a Mac specific Family Tree Maker group. Mm -hmm. uh, Donna said, "I don't have Pam Microsoft Word. Does FBC mm -hmm. play nice with Mac Pages?" Um, so I know that features like the like renumbering figures and citations and all the in index, I don't think that plays nice with pages. John, do you know more? Yeah, I know it does work. Uh, it does support uh, open office, which I believe that there is a Mac version and it is free. Um, and also FBC, you can export right to PDF. Um, and you can, it doesn't have to be a Word document that you're including in there. You can, if, if pages exports to PDF, then you can add that as the media item in Family Tree Maker and do all the same stuff with Family Book Creator. It's just, you can't, in, like I said, like renumber pictures and things like that. Yeah. And and you could also ask Stefan, because I mean, I'm sure he's, people have probably asked him stuff and uh, so he may know more about what the limitations of Mac pages are, so. I think I didn't specifically answer why, Lois, why to turn them on and off for the mirror margins. Uh, we turn them off originally because what Family Book Creator thinks is the left and right pages changes because we are adding all these pages in. And so, and what our original pages thought were left and right changes. And so it's best to just have everybody assume all the pages are the same until the end because they're they're coming from two different places and trying to merge together. And I just... Another question for you. Um, I'm not very good at writing biographies, and, you know, um, but so what I've been doing is taking my facts and putting them in the chat uh, GPT or oh, yeah. whatever it is. And, but it's, it's not the way I talk. So I kind of try to, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so using AI is a really new thing that everyone's still trying to, to navigate. I think it's helpful to use whenever whenever we have a tool we can use. Um, I haven't done it much myself because I'm kind of a control freak. <laughs> I think it's nice to have a base though to start from. And if it's not talking like you talk, I think you can do things like be more, you know, be more casual or write this again with more with less formal language or things like that. I think you can guide AI. To be more okay, similar to you. That. Okay. Yeah, so that can be helpful. It's never going to sound quite like you. Um, another thing to experiment with would be to, instead of trying to write it all out, record yourself in audio um, talking about these things. And then you can have a transcript of that audio, and that's going to sound a lot more like you. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I just like to point out that if anyone hasn't, um, be sure to download the Family Book Creator Users Group, mm -hmm. and especially like for those um, fact types like handle story of text. If nothing else, um, sc uh, scroll down to the two page appendix. Um, you know, and here's you know here's you know the handle story is text, so it's used to include content from a word processor documents as a document. And then, you know, as family check, and then it gives you the page number. And if you're looking at it on the computer, you can just click on it and it takes you right there as to more in depth as to how to use it. So, um, and then even, and then here's like that privacy protection. It's like, cause Casey said, I was like, well, I don't want this ex-wife, you know, we never have kids, so I don't even want her mentioned in the book. And you can use that and then 
family book creator will pretend she doesn't exist, you know, <laughs> or or he doesn't exist, or um. Or you, you can even go into more details where maybe some family members like, well, okay, I know this book's only for family, but I don't want certain details printed. So you could tell it, okay, just print just their name or, you know, or don't print their media or, you know, there's lots of options. You know, you go to it, you know, use suppress everything, you know, anonymous or just say living deceased only the name, you know, and then even down to like what type of media is included. And so you've got lots of privacy options so that you can put on a per person basis. I see Sandra has a question. She says, when you are typing your Word document, are you inserting the photos or is FBC adding the photos where they need to go? Um, I am inserting the photos. So I'll show you real quick how I do that. So this is just an example document with some text in it. I can take any picture and drag it into my screen. So let me, here, we'll take a picture of my book. I can drag it from Windows into my document. It's gonna show up like this originally. And then the important thing to know how to do is after I click on it, there's this little rainbow looking icon that appears in the upper right corner. So if I'm not, it's not there. If I click on it, it's there. And I like to use text wrapping. And that moves everything out of the way. So right now I've grabbed the corner, this little white circle in the corner, and I'm making the picture smaller. And Word is automatically adjusting that for me. Because I've, I've told Word, I want you to move text around my pictures. Now this text, this picture I already had in here is not moving automatically. So I'm going to have to move that myself. But I can do the same thing after I do text wrapping text wrapping, I can add captions here with a, a right click and an insert caption. And then they become boxes that I can move around with my pictures as well. And I can even group them if I want them to stay together all the time. So that's how I add pictures in my books. You can also do like insert pictures from this device. Um, I'm, a, I'm a drag and drop kind of gal. Rebecca, while you're on that page there, um... Uh, when I do a Word document, I insert a picture in there or something. I have trouble getting it to move. What are you getting it to move? move? So are you are you doing this text wrapping thing? Or are you leaving it in line with text? Uh, I think it's in line. I don't think I'm yeah. doing the text wrapping yet. So that'll that's be that's I'm the doing. answer then. Yeah, because otherwise it just kind of stays in line with text. I I never like that look. I I don't see how anyone yeah. would use that one. Uh, I, I was but, just playing around with it. I'm just kind of curious and I couldn't mm -hmm. get it to move. So, yep, okay. text wrapping will, will be the answer to that. And you have some options for text wrapping. So, sometimes if it's like a wider picture, I'll choose this one, which is top and bottom. And that moves things above and below my picture. Um, so, sometimes that's the thing I want to happen. But most of the time, I like it to be around my picture. And then you can format your picture. Like I personally, I just like having rounded corners, but there's all kinds. If you click on the picture, you'll see an option up here for picture format. If you don't see picture format, you probably haven't clicked on the picture. If I'm just in the text, there's nothing up there. As soon as I click on it, I have these options and then you can style it in all kinds of ways. And I do have macro a macro that will take your styling for one picture and apply it to every picture in your document, but that's a little bit more advanced. All right. Anybody else? All right, well, do visit, oh, somebody. Yeah, I have a question because, um, you know, I've been working on this particular book, which will be the fifth one, I think. Um, and I've been asked if I could strip it down for a kid-friendly version. Um, because when we have reunions, you know, we're giving these books out, the adults are getting them, kids don't seem to be quite that interested. However, in school, they are always asked about 
um, you know, they write something about their grandparents or this or that. But I just wondered if you had any experience with, you know, any kind of book that would be kid friendly. Oh, interesting question. I haven't personally done it. Uh, I think the more pictures, the better, because kids are generally very visual. In, in the case of a kid, I think I would probably do more um, list format, the way the census document was listed out. So not using sentences, just because it's it's a little easier to skim and it's um, less for them to have to comprehend if they're new to reading. That's one change I would make with, with the data. Um, do you know how to do that? Do you want me to show you? Oh, no, I, I know how to do that. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I wonder if you can sit down with the kid and just ask them, what would you like to see in a book about your grandparents? Okay, that, that's an idea. Um, yeah, because for me, my mind will be going all over the place and I want to put this, 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 and that. And yeah, scale it back, man. They, they Less is more for kids. And think about, you know, things that they probably care more about an occupation than a cause of death, for example. Um, and they might need more explanation on that occupation. So I had a, I, my great, great grandfather was a fireman and I thought, oh, he fights fires. No, <laughs> his job was to keep the fires going at the electrical company to power the electrical, um, the, the street cars. So he was making fire, not fighting it, but I wouldn't have known that. Okay. Good okay. luck. That sounds fun. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I do encourage you to go to my website, um, sign up for the mailing list, and then you get updates because I'm already working on my next book right now. And then I also have a Facebook group. I'll put a link in the chat if you want to join. Um, so usually when people have questions, I ask them to try to post in the group. That way everyone can see the answer instead of emailing me directly. But you can also do that. I'll put my email in here. And let me go find my Facebook group for you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Maybe I'll see. <clears throat> maybe I'll see you at Rootstack next year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. So, and then uh, this recording will probably be up within an hour or so on the Family Book Creators uh, YouTube channel. So. Great. Oh. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.